and uh, then I would like to um, uh, go to the next lecture. Uh, next, it's a pleasure for me to introduce um, Professor Antonia Politi from uh, Aberdeen University, UK, uh, with uh, uh, his lecture um, uh, regarding the, the conductivity in chains of nonlinear oscillators. Uh, Professor Antonio Politi is a uh, well-known expert in this area, and we are very glad that we can hear your lecture. So, Antonio, please, your word. Okay, so what is uh, the subject of my talk? Today I'm going to talk about uh, a very old problem, which uh, still uh, is not completely solved. And, and uh, the, I should, first of all, remember recall the name of my two main collaborators also in uh, connection to what I'm going to talk today is uh, both of them from Florence Stefano Lepri and Roberto Livi. So uh, I mean first of all let's say I mean uh, from the title I'm going to talk about quasi normal so uh, condu uh, con conductivity in one dimensional system. This is something which uh, I'm, I'm going to explain why and what, what's the reason for this and uh, I will first of all uh, recall briefly the scenario, the way it has been built over many years of works by different groups. Then I'm recalling briefly a series of numerical inconsistencies with uh, this scenario that has been put forward. Then I'm going to uh, introduce the conjecture we have proposed uh, very recently to say explain not all the inconsistencies but uh, many of them and, uh, and then I'm going to discuss uh, numerical validation in two models essentially the uh, white works and uh, I mean I also finally a few words uh, explaining uh, what are still the say open problems in a sense. Okay so the, for let me first uh, define the physical setup I'm uh, referring to. The physical setup is uh, one dimensional chains, ideally very long, uh, the theoretical results uh, are expected to hold uh, in the limit of infinitely long chains, or if not infinitely long, uh, they should be long enough in some sense. Uh, in principle, uh, there are interactions uh, nearest neighbors and also possibly with a, a background, uh, which uh, I will very soon forget about, but for completeness I'm mentioning this as well. So, and the beginning at the end of the chain, the chain itself is in contact with the two thermal reservoirs. And if they are operating at different temperature, what is going to happen is a energy or heat flux from the hot to the cold reservoir. So the question is uh, to determine how this flux uh, changes when you consider longer uh, chains. And, uh, so in order to do that, you have to define formally an effective thermal conductivity, which is uh, defined the following way. You imagine to uh, run an experiment or to run a simulation, you measure the amount of energy that is being exchanged. You divide this by the elapsed time. So this is the flux. There are different ways of defining the flux, but for the purpose of this talk, uh, we you can only simply think of energy that is flowing through the boundaries. And then you divide this by the thermal gradient. Thermal gradient, you can take this definition in a very simple way, meaning it is the, the temperature difference divided by the system size. So the question is, uh, what does it happen to this ratio when the length of the system is let go uh, to uh, infinity? And, uh, uh, finite conductivity, which means uh, the validity of the Fourier law, as it was uh, stated in the beginning of the 19th century, if it stays finite, which, which means that uh, the uh, numerator decreases as 1 over L, because the denominator by construction is uh, uh, of the order 1 over L, if it stays finite, then you say, aha, uh -huh, Fourier law is uh, satisfied, but if uh, uh, it scales differently, then eventually you may have either a divergence or, uh, of the conductivity or uh, even might go to zero. I mean, uh, what makes the problem interesting is that in many models it has been discovered that quite often there is a divergence. So there is this exponent alpha, which is a measure of the degree of anomalous behavior. 
So that's, uh, that's the problem uh, that, uh, and now here I'm summarizing very quickly. I mean, we don't really need to go through the details. It's only the excuse uh, to remind you what kind of approaches have been developed over the years, starting from uh, dynamical renormalization group uh, or some other people looked at the Boltzmann Piles equation. Uh, and uh, also more self-consistent mode coupling or finally some very rigorous uh, diagrammatic methods. And the, the, the outcome is better discuss, say, uh, re illustrated in this, uh, in this diagram uh, here. So let's, I mean, this is the, the scenario which is assumed to be valid and uh, uh, let, you have to read uh, from top to bottom. So first of all, think of the entire system, set of one dimensional systems, and you want to ask yourself, uh, uh, what is the behavior? And then there is a first bifurcation, uh, and the first bifurcation is uh, between this box here, normal, and then this other um, green dot. So let's go here. And uh, whenever you have a substrate potential, which means, uh, let me go back a moment uh, to this uh, picture over here, I mean, whenever you have a potential interaction with the substrate potential, so it means that there is no uh, translational invariance. So whenever this term is present there, in all the models where this is true, then it turns out that the conductivity is normal. So you have a Fourier law that is satisfied. Here instead you have all of the rest and you have another bifurcation. And it depends on the kind of displacement that is in the degree of freedom that is involved in uh, the, the process. If uh, the degree of freedom is, a non, is an angular uh, rotation, then uh, like rotors of any kind, then uh, once again, uh, the conductivity is finite, is normal. But uh, all in all other cases, ideally, you expect anomalous. All other case means uh, can, you can imagine your favorite chains of nonlinear oscillator with either longitudinal or transversal displacement. In all these cases, it's anomalous, meaning that uh, this exponent alpha I recalled in the previous slide is larger than zero and uh, depending on symmetry of the potential, it may be either equal to one third or equal to uh, one half. So in any case, the important point is different and larger than zero. And it means that the larger the system, the higher is the conductivity. Okay, that's a, that's a, the scenario. This scenario in, uh, in some sense has been uh, validated experimentally because there is already a low in old, but there have been more recent experiments which confirm that indeed, uh, when you take uh, some carbon nanotubes and you change uh, the length and you measure the heat, the, the, the heat conductivity, you discover it grows. I mean, the, the accuracy of the experiment cannot be so good as to claim it's one third rather than one half, but uh, the presence of the anomaly is uh, well established. But what happens at the level of uh, numerical simulations? Because in numerical simulation, you have, uh, say, the chance of running more accurate tests. You can at least control, in principle, a lot of details. And here it, it comes a problem, in a sense, because uh, I'm just listing not all, but uh, those uh, type of anomalies that are somehow related to the problem I want to address uh, today. So there are, I mean, I'm just, I was classifying in a different type of uh, examples. So one, some chains where there is a bond uh, dissociation. Imagine of a uh, case, for instance, uh, leonard john potential, which uh, vanish, which means that the force vanishes when uh, the distance between particles uh, gets uh, too large. And in this case, uh, it has been observed a seemingly diffusive behavior. So if you rely on the simulations, uh, then it looks like the conductivity doesn't diverge, or if it in increases, it increases very slowly. Then there is another class of systems where you uh, consider double well potentials, and uh, that's another case where unexpectedly you find almost uh, constant conductivity. Even the same more strange, is uh, um, our simulations performed in the Fermi Pasta Ulam Singu model in the limit of low energy, where it was observed uh, again relatively uh, constant conductivity. Then, uh, additionally, simulations made with the Toda potential, with the hard point gas, 
And, and there is finally also another type. A ding dong model is a fancy way of saying that um, there are two, essentially two lattices. Uh, one is a harmonic chain, so uh, interaction not with the nearest neighbor, second nearest neighbor. And in, in, the, in between two particles of the harmonic lattice, uh, there are particles which are free to move and collide uh, elastically with uh, the other particle. That's another model where for some specific values of the parameter, it turns out that uh, conductivity is finite. So does this mean that the, some, something in the theory is wrong? Uh, what, what's the meaning? Uh, can, can we find an explanation, a justification? And that's uh, the motivation uh, for our recent work. And uh, I'm going now, from now on, to present the conjecture. And the conjecture, I mean, let me anticipate the result is, uh, we claim that uh, if you consider large enough systems, uh, you should eventually observe the anomaly that is theoretically predicted. But uh, in, uh, maybe sometimes this uh, system size is much too large and is not accessible. So but how, let, let's proceed conceptually. So the idea is the following, that when you have a finite system, and actually another important point, I mean, all what I'm saying, applies to uh, the nonlinear systems, but close to the limit where uh, uh, the system is integrable. I mean, why we consider this? We consider it for one simple reason, because it's somehow astonishing the fact that, uh, I mean, if the system is integrable, you expect ballistic behavior. So you even expect a full, I mean, that the flux is constant and that the conductivity should, uh, say, diverge linearly with that. So in the vicinity of a perfectly integrable system, you would expect a very anomalous, uh, intuitively speaking, a very anomalous behavior. Instead, several of the simulations I was mentioning in the previous slide show that very often close to the integrable limit, you do see a quasi uh, normal conductivity. So that, that's the setup, and here means uh, that yeah, the flux now in, uh, depends on L, as uh, it has to be expected, and obviously it, it depends on a control parameter. Epsilon, for me, is the distance from the integrable limit, meaning that if I set this equal to zero, everything should be purely ballistic. So our conjecture is that the flux is the sum of two contributions. Let me start from the right one, the one with an A. This is the anomalous contribution, the one which it comes out from any theory of hydrodynam fluctuating hydrodynamics and is the one which scales as it was described in the general picture before. So, the anomalous component is something that I expect to scale this way, the flux, with alpha being either one third, one half, doesn't matter. And on top of it, there is, in principle, a hypothetical dependence on epsilon, which I will return later on. And, but that's not the entire story. The, entire, the story is also that we expect a normal component, normal uh, essentially due to the uh, kinetic of the I mean, what does it mean that the system is integrable? It means that there are integral of motion. So it means that there are some objects that are, for instance, solitons in the case of total lattice, which are traveling ballistically from left to right and vice versa. And they carry energy. And uh, when you are close to the integrable limit, you can expect that uh, they interact a little bit uh, and uh, they behave uh, as, in a no I mean, you would expect them to behave in a normal way. And uh, we uh, take, I mean, we formalize the concept stating that this normal component uh, essentially depends uh, in a combined way on the actual length and the closeness to the uh, integrable limit uh, in this way, which is summarized over here. So we, it's, we introduce the concept of effective length where uh, this, uh, L of epsilon is the mean free path. So we, uh, we, are, we anticipate that these waves, these solitons, whatever they are, they, they propagate freely only up to a given length. This length is longer and longer. The epsilon value is smaller and smaller. And, and then the value of the flux depends on uh, the ratio between the actual length and this uh, mean free path. 
And in other words, we expect that this normal component is, uh, if xi is very small, meaning that uh, the mean free path is much longer than the system size, you really see ballistic behavior. But if uh, uh, um, xi is very large, uh, you, you see diffusive behavior. And that's uh, the property of this component here on the left. And the total flux is the sum of two contributions. Now let's put together these two and uh, it comes out the following. It comes out that uh, uh, if you also, okay, so I, I have forgotten to say uh, or to, to state in a more clear way that uh, when epsilon goes to zero, we expect the mean free path to diverge. So theta is larger than zero. This means uh, that the mean free path diverges with uh, some uh, law that may depend, and indeed it depends on the type of uh, set physical setup I want to consider. But uh, so here is the sum, I mean, here is really the formalization in all details of the conjecture that we have uh, formulated. We, so the flux is the sum, let me start again from the right, the, nor the anomalous component, and there is the normal component. Why it's, I say it's normal? Because you see the scaling behavior of the first part is one over L, is exactly what you expect uh, for a perfectly um, uh, diffusive behavior. But addition and here this term, uh, the, uh, the dependence of this normal component, I mean, has a, a singular behavior. When epsilon is, gets very, very small, uh, I mean, this uh, factor here is very large. So the, the idea is that whenever you are close to the uh, integrable limit, this component is very large, stays very large, and only when L is uh, the, the system size, yeah, I mean, if it goes to infinity sooner or later, this is going to win because this uh, is decreasing slower than that, but it may take a long, uh, I mean, not, not a long time, so you may need the really very, very large systems. And actually everything is summarized here, this term over here, is going to win only above a system size which scales with epsilon according to this to this law. Okay, so that's the, the that's the idea. Is it true or not? And uh, uh, so we started make the first test was the atomic hard point gas. So let me first of all recall you what the hard point gas is. Is a hard is a, is a gas of particles, uh, uh, so a line one uh, on a one dimensional uh, line, uh, and uh, the particles have at least the setup uh, we have considered is with the two type of masses that alternate with each other. And the, they are colliding in a perfectly elastic way. So this means that whenever there is a collision, in the, after the collision, you have to confer to the, 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 both the momentum and the kinetic energy have to be conserved. And the transformation of the velocity is a linear transformation, which uh, is summarized over here. It depends uh, uh, obviously on the mass differences. Now, this uh, model is uh, known uh, to be, uh, say, ergodic when the masses are different, but in the limit when the two masses are equal to one another, then uh, the model is perfectly integrable. And uh, what happens is summarized here in this picture over there. You see, okay, this is space. These are essentially the movement of the particles, the different lines correspond to the particles. And this, uh, uh, say circles correspond to the collision. So let's just uh, uh, look at what happens here in, perfect, in the case of perfectly identical masses. So the two particles are coming together and collide. I mean, these uh, are the arrows here. And uh, just because they have the masses, they essentially exchange the velocity. So in practice, the, first, the particle on the right follow this path and then it's uh, deflected, uh, scattered in this direction. But it looks even um, superficially like you have a particle that keeps moving in this direction, which is not true, but uh, conceptually it is the same. And uh, you can summarize uh, this by claiming that there are velocity, we call them velocitons. So, if a particle uh, with a certain velocity is entering the system from the left, then it keeps uh, moving with this unchanged velocity until it arrives at the right border. And uh, that's the reason why this system is uh, perfectly, uh, say, uh, integrable and this uh, ballistic behavior. 
But if as soon as the masses are different from, from one another, then uh, you have to uh, introduce, uh, I mean, you have to take into account that there is a sort of diffusive process. Now here, I mean, uh, I may skip the details. The, the, the final message it comes out from here is that uh, uh, as soon as you have a little a tiny difference uh, in the masses, this epsilon is over here, you can uh, define a mean free path. And what we uh, only need to understand is the, how the mean free path is uh, scaling with epsilon. In this case, uh, I mean, uh, you can uh, conclude and understand uh, that uh, the scaling is of this type. So it diverges as one over epsilon squared. So that all the rest is essentially technicalities that are not important. Now here it's essentially one figure where uh, the important results are summarized. Because what I'm doing here, I'm plotting. Uh, kappa is the uh, conductivity, the effective conductivity that I measure in a system of size L. But instead of plotting uh, kappa versus L, uh, I'm considering also a way to superpose the results for different uh, uh, values of epsilon. So the smaller is epsilon, the closer you are to the uh, uh, integrable limit. So I'm plotting the conductivity versus xi is essentially the effective length, which means the actual length L multiplied by epsilon square and uh, uh, Analogously, I am plotting here the conductivity multiplied again by epsilon square. And what you see is that, the, oh, be aware also that uh, um, the epsilon goes essentially to zero from top to bottom. So the larger value of epsilon correspond to this curve over here. The smaller correspond to the black curve, which is say hardly visible, but nevertheless. So you see, I mean, that there is, upon uh, in decreasing epsilon, there is a tendency to converge towards some specific uh, final curve, which is independent of epsilon, once you plot the data this way. And also you see uh, something in a sense uh, obvious that, uh, I mean, if epsilon is larger, which then uh, can look at the, the uppermost curve, uh, the, the conductivity, yes, tends to, converge to some final value, but then it deviates again, suggesting that sooner or later you should observe some really anomalous behavior. Anomalous behavior, notice that these are both um, um, logarithmic scales should correspond to a straight line growth. Surely there is no any, re, um, say, range of values here where you, you can definitely speak of a divergence according to some power law. But uh, the important point I want to stress over here is that the closer is epsilon uh, to zero and the, clo the, the closer you are to a, a really perfectly uh, uh, diffusive behavior. Yes or not? I mean, let's pose this question in a more quantitative way. So what I'm going to do here, okay, let's before, uh, what I'm going to do here, I'm just, having noticed that there is a convergence towards some asymptotic curve, I have taken the uh, epsilon value, the smallest uh, that I have been able to, um, to consider, and now I focus on the behavior of the flux. I mean, instead of looking at the conductivity, I look at directly at the flux. And these are these uh, full circles. This is how the flux uh, is changing uh, as a function of the effective length. And the red curve is a fit with a very simple uh, function, which is represented here. And what is the meaning of this function? The meaning of this function is if you, uh, once again, this is the effective length. If it goes to zero, it's finite value. Finite value is perfectly consistent with the, the prediction of ballistic behavior, because uh, it means that the flux is independent of the system size. On the other hand, for, for xi going to infinity, at some point this 3.73 uh, is negligible. So it, it, this function decay, decays as one over xi, exactly what uh, you expect for a diffusive behavior. And so the defeat is, uh, I mean, uh, for me, astonishingly good because it's, uh, I mean, uh, you, you put really the minimal ingredients. And uh, so th that, that's really telling us that this curve, the black curve is essentially a curve which is going to saturate, said in, in a different way. So, uh, and um, if I go back to this, this 
punch the hypothetical scaling behavior, it means that we are in a region for the moment where this term is uh, absolutely uh, the, the, the largest one, while this is uh, totally negligible. Now, let's go back over here. So now, uh, before, I mean, now I want to jump to another model and then uh, this model, I mean, in this case, we didn't do anything. Just we, uh, we went to this paper published uh, some years ago. We extracted the data. They were not plotting uh, the results uh, the way we wanted. So what is this model? Sorry. The atomic uh, TODA. The atomic mo uh, TODA means uh, that, uh, uh, again, you, you have two masses with slightly different value. And if the masses, uh, you set them equal to one another, you have the TODA model, which is known since many, many years to be integrable, to be characterized by solitons. So the setup is, uh, if you want, uh, is a similar to the previous one, except now because of this potential is a smoothened version of the hard point gas. And once again, the scaling parameter is the uh, asymmetry in the masses. And so what we did was to take data produced by others and just plotting them as a function of the effective length, which is uh, as before. And uh, the same tendency is present here. You see that for the smallest value of epsilon, the black curve, there is a clear evidence to converge to some specific uh, asymptotic shape, which is flat. And uh, the larger is epsilon, so which means the larger is the mass mismatch. And then uh, the, 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 the larger is the, is the flux, meaning that is affected by the anomalous component. Okay, we didn't do more than that because uh, this data couldn't be processed in a very accurate way, but nevertheless, uh, they confirm this, the, 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 this scenario. Now I go to another setup, which we have analyzed in a very qual quantitative way. It is a, a, a model uh, uh, still, I mean, we, we took the, the TODA, so they set the, the reference system is TODA again, but instead of breaking the uh, integrability by uh, introducing a mass difference, we have added the random collision, a stochastic term, uh, which is known uh, to break the um, integrability. And in this case, the parameter which is controlling the strength of the, the, the degree of non-integrability is the probability to have collisions between, uh, between the two uh, randomly chosen neighboring pairs. This uh, parameter, we call it gamma. And it turns out that in this case, uh, the scaling of the mean free path is not, uh, say, one over gamma uh, square, it's just one over gamma. So this means that in order to observe the same scenario, same type of structure, you have this case to multiply here by gamma instead of gamma square. And analog analogously here, you have to multiply by gamma instead of epsilon square. But other than that, you, you see again that upon decreasing gamma from uh, 0.16 down to 0 0.005, you converge to a curve which seems to saturate whenever you plot towards the effective length. So what is uh, uh, the meaning of this? I and mean, once again, you can uh, focus only on the, sm the smallest value of gamma and try to see to what extent it really corresponds to a, a sort of normal behavior. And uh, the Green triangles are the numerical, say data, and the, the purple curve is a fit. Now, this fit in this case is not as, uh, say, simple as uh, in the previous case. We had to add another term, which has no conceptual consequence in the sense that when psi diverges, this is uh, disappearing. So the, so the long, uh, so the large system limit is still diffusive because it is one of the type one of Xc. And also this term is negligible when Xi goes to zero because this is uh, the leading term. So in the two limits of Xi going to zero, Xi going to infinity, you have the ballistic behavior, so it stays finite or vice versa, it diverges one over Xi. And uh, so once again, we see that uh, the, uh, one of the two components is a real
output, but uh, I should say if I go back to the slide to the to the statement over here, sorry, here uh, is uh, yeah. You see here that uh, uh, I focused on this term. Can we extract quantitative information on this? Now, what I'm going to show you uh, is the following. The numerical simulations give us this. Now, the analysis made for very small epsilon allow us to determine this term once for all. So now what I'm going to do is to focus on this quantity over here, in which way just subtracting from the uh, actual value of the flux, the normal component. And that's exactly what I am doing over here. Uh, Yes, here it is. So what I'm now doing is I uh, consider the flux, which is really coming out of the direct simulation. I subtract the component that I have uh, extracted from the previous analysis, and I want to see how does this component, this hypothetically anomalous component, scale with L. And that's uh, done for the two models I have been considered, the Harpoint gas and the Toda model. Now, these two different symbols correspond to the fact that I took two different uh, simulate two different values of epsilon. And uh, I, I repeat, I'm subtracting the normal component and then I'm plotting versus L. And you do see that uh, this is almost two decades over which the slope is minus 0 0.66, which is in absolute perfect agreement with the prediction of uh, fluctuating hydrodynamics, because this is what you would have uh, expected. And uh, uh, similarly for TODA. Now, I mean, TODA requires a slightly different discussion because uh, I, mean, uh, I should tell you that uh, in this case, the theoretical expectation is minus one half, and uh, the range of validity here is not as good as here, but nevertheless, uh, it's a, a very, a very good one. So now I'm, near, I'm almost close uh, to, to the end. I want only to finish with uh, one point. I mean, let me go back here. There is an issue I forgot in a sense. Uh, I didn't stress. When we write this, uh, all of the uh, theoretical arguments are uh, based on the assumption that this coefficient here doesn't diverge when epsilon goes to zero. And this seems to be exactly the case for the TODA model. This seems to be the case for the hard point gas. And you might ask yourself, what about the simplest integrable system, harmonic chains? If I play the game for harmonic chains, in the case of harmonic chains, this exponent diverges. And then this, uh, it's another story. And that's uh, summarized here. There was even some work that we did uh, 10 years ago and we could conclude that in harmonic chain with a little bit of flux, I'm mean, sorry, with a little bit of collisions, external collisions, we could conclude that this coefficient diverges and it's, the divergence is, is here. So that's to say that in many cases, so the take home message, I mean, uh, in many models where the dynamics is close to an integrable limit, you have to expect uh, normal behavior, diffusive behavior, just because uh, it takes a lot. I mean, you really need to go to extremely long chains to see the anomalous component. But that's not always the case. The harmonic uh, uh, model, for some reason, which I still don't understand, is uh, say special and uh, uh, one might maybe would like to understand why it is special and i think uh, that's uh, that's all i mean okay thank you for patience thank you thank you very much antonio for your interesting lecture please uh, um, uh, now um, colleagues you can ask questions yeah yeah yeah, hello Antonio. Hi. Very nice lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, so I wanted to ask you about one of the slides where you mentioned uh, works by different authors and the title was uh, something like seemingly diffusing behavior. Mm -hmm. Yes. So why, why do you call it seemingly diffusive? Because I, as I know, those authors claim that uh, in their models, the behavior is truly diffusive, so to say. 
I, but you call it seemingly diffusive and I, I think you do it intentionally. Absolutely, because at least uh, the outcome of uh, uh, my theory, uh, in, which is not uh, completely rigorous, I have to admit, but no, is that it is seeming because uh, if in, uh, as, so long as it is true that the flux is the sum of two contributions, uh, whenever you have, let me go back, I mean, if we are still sharing, I don't know if it is the screen, is it still sharing? Yes, I can see it. Okay, so if, uh, if, if you go here, I mean, so long that this, uh, that this is true, Whenever mm -hmm. the, the 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 length is larger than this value here, this mm -hmm. the anomalous component is going is going to win always. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's why I mean I, I don't want to say that uh, th this is going to be tr say the explanation in all cases. I cannot be sure, but uh, many of them I'm pretty convinced that they are covered by this uh, assumption. That's, I mean, uh, th that's the scaling behavior. I mean, you need, uh, uh, you, know, you need to have a system size that is larger than this. Mm -hmm. so, the, so that's my... Okay, okay. colleagues, uh, we're a little bit running out of time, but uh, still I see, I, I see the hand. Uh, Alexey Sokolov, can you uh, ask a question, but pr please very briefly. Okay, uh, hello, so thank you for a very interesting talk. Uh, I would like to ask you, uh, introduce on slide 10, mean-free path. Uh, so uh, the question is, uh, mean-free path be between what? Uh, so is it between solitons or some particles? Because usually in the literature, uh, people uh, talk about phonons and this concept, it's not very well uh, defined. Okay, no, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, uh, in fact, I was uh, not very uh, detailed. I mean, I have I mean, uh, in mind that uh, in the ballistic, I mean, in the perfectly, inter perfectly interval, it means that there are integrals of motions. And integrals of motion, let me make reference to TODA because it's the easiest. I mean, the, uh, the, the energy is carried by localized objects, which are solitons, and they travel undisturbed in the perfectly integrable limit. As soon as uh, you uh, break integrability, maybe as I did by introducing a mass difference, these solitons don't travel freely and they, they interact. And my idea is that uh, at this point, you can, you can define a mean free path. That's a, not an issue, I must say, that I have discussed uh, and we have entered in full uh, accuracy because uh, what is interesting for, for what we need is only how this mean free path scales with, uh, with uh, this uh, parameter of uh, lack of, uh, I mean, non in, of integrability. But I mean, uh, but I have implicitly in mind, uh, I mean, uh, th this, I mean, I, you need to have uh, these traveling objects, integrals of motion, uh, with solitons, or in the case of hard point gas, this concept of, vol uh, of velociton is, is the velocity carried by the particle. And in a sense, I mean, it should be phonons for uh, harmonic chains, but they seem to behave differently because the harmonic chain is different. And that's uh, something I don't know. I mean, that's, uh, that's an open, uh, open question. I cannot say more than that, sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, Please, any other questions? Uh, maybe uh, I myself will ask questions. Antonio, th once more, thank you very much. Really very interesting, I think very important lecture because uh, what I think is that, um, uh, well, we can uh, consider model systems, but, but if we can, uh, we try to apply them for the real situations, we have really um, some kind of, of finite number of particles and finite times. And this means that uh, what we can observe is diffusive or ballistic behavior def depends only also on the scales, uh, time scale and length scale we are really uh, consider in real systems. So um, as I understand, this is uh, also very important in, in one case is one uh, behavior or another can uh, take over. Am I correct in this? No, no, yes. I, I, I fully agree. I fully agree. It's, uh, sometimes one, my, one point is to make the claim that uh, ideally uh, in the thermodynamic limit, uh, 
anomalous behavior uh, is win. But if uh, this uh, system size is so long that it has no experimental relevance, uh, one should stick uh, to the fact that uh, sure, sure. The behavior is, uh, is diffusive. So it's, uh, uh, I fully agree. Okay, thank you. Thank you uh, very much uh, once more for your lecture.